To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Backyard Gardens podcast. Your lovely hosts here are Ben and Batavia. Yes, that's right. And we're going to try and make gardening, I don't know, I don't want to say a little bit easier, but it's, you know, as we get into the off, the quote unquote off season and we move into what we like to think of as the planning season, there's really a whole new season. Um, You know, these are some things that we can definitely look for and we can keep in mind and, you know, we want to keep them top of mind. These are really, some of these are basic, but (laughs) as, as you'll hear we have both made and still continue to make these mistakes, I'm sure, as we go through. So, um, you know, this is not about starting a garden. Mostly, I want to look at it as keeping your garden running smoothly. And I think that's what we want to do is keep our garden running smoothly so we can focus more on being productive. Wouldn't you say, Batavia? Batavia would say. Batavia would say. So, And by the way, Batavia is talking cryptic today, so good luck. Um, And real quick, before we get started, our next episode is going to air on Halloween. So we want to do something a little bit different, kind of like what we've done in the past. Um, We want we're going to watch a movie and not on the air, but we are going to watch a movie that kind of relates to this and um, to gardening. And we're going to discuss it. So, um, the movie that we have chosen, it is a horror movie that is not bloody. It is not super scary unless you are into gardening and stuff like that. There's not copious amounts of blood. There's not a lot of cussing. Pretty good to watch. It's called Hold Your Breath and it's on Hulu. So, it's all about the Dust Bowl. So, um, we'll be talking about the Dust Bowl a little bit. I have to admit when I watched it, I already watched it, but Tavia hasn't. I got super panicky because of the situation they were living in. And then I started looking into the Dust Bowl and I was floored by what I started to learn. So if you guys want to watch it, it's an hour and a half, not a super long movie. It's called Hold Your Breath. It's on Hulu. And that is what the next episode will be about. So um, definitely want to check that out. It's a good movie. I recommend it. And um, I think we'll learn a lot from it. And maybe we can correct some of our mistakes in the past. Wait, we're going back in time to correct past mistakes? We're preventing, excuse me, preventing, Mm. preventing. All right, Mm. I'm going to give this one more try. Yeah. Yeah, because I started reading about statistics. Never a good idea. But we got Batavia to say more than three words, so we're going in a good spot. So let me tell y'all something. (laughs) Here we go. If you're new here, welcome. If you have been a short time, mid time or a long time listener, you know that I can get wordy. That is me in my everyday life. That's me in my professional life. That's me in all the versions of my life. And so this morning, I just I I wasn't ready for the tussle before we started recording. I was just like, okay, Yeah. And I have in my short responses in my complete acquiescing I have like stumped young Ben he's visibly uncomfortable with out the whole fight in me so I'm not going to apologize and I'm not going to say get used to it but I am going to remind you that you really do love all of my wordiness me? even though you pretend that you don't me clearly I don't mind um If you didn't talk, it'd be horrible to be on the phone. I just listen to you breathe. (laughs) And that is one of my pet peeves. I don't like to listen to people breathe, eat, or drink. (laughs) It's called uh, misophonia, and I'm sorry for everybody who suffers with it. If the sound of chewing food drives you absolutely crazy, you got it. I wrote, I have a note in my phone about that, about you, because I'm always like, which one is it? Does he not want to see me eat or does he not want to hear me? When you first started trying to figure it out, you would turn your camera off, but the volume would be up and it would drive me (laughs) insane. Yeah. I mean, it it makes me kind of almost get violent. It's, it's a shame and it really is a problem, but I don't know. You can't do anything about it. Anyway, generally speaking, it's your problem. Right, you know, but we, sometimes we're like on here for hours. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, and you're like, I need to get a little snack. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. Um, my son eats potato chips out of a bag. You know, he'll get the little bait, small bags or whatever, and he <laughs> eats them one at a time. So it's the crinkling of the hand going in, the chip, the crunch, the chew. And then it's like, because it'll take him like 20 minutes to eat one small bag. And I'm just like, I can't do it. Like, you've got, you know, you've got to go somewhere else. Get away from me. So I was uh, talking to my cousin. What am I? I mean, I got a bunch of cousins, but I was talking to one of my cousins and um, I have my earbud in and I'm outside. And so this is after a couple of conversations where he's like, are you going through a wind tunnel? So he's also long winded. So I can mute him and like do a whole chore. Yeah. And so he's like, are you still there? Or do you have me on mute? I'm like, you need to choose. I'm sweeping. Do you want to hear the background noise? Or do you want to just trust that I'm still here? It's daytime hours. I've not fallen asleep. Don't worry. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> it's not past noon. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, um, keeping our garden running smoothly. That's that's on the topic for today. And I think it's really important because I don't know about you, Batavia, but have you gone through the garden and just, you know, it seems like sometimes you're just fighting yourself. Mm, never I never experience it in the moment I never realize yeah. it but you know I'll look back on last month and say like how did my garden become an uphill battle like when it when did that happen yeah. you know? well and the thing is too um you know with the gardening and stuff it's and even homesteading a lot of problems are compounded over time Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not something that pops up real quick and it, it can kind of catch us by surprise. And um, I think I'm the same as you. I'll, I'll look back, you know, I put in, um, I, let me hold off on this story because it goes into one of the things on the list. But um, the biggest thing I think that I struggle with well, not actually, they're all the biggest, so I'm not even going to front, <laughs> but one of the big things that I struggled with in the very beginning and moving forward, it, it seems to be getting better now, but it, it's really, it's growing what I and my family like to eat. You know, um, when I first started gardening and I fig I found the power of harvesting food, it felt to me like I had to grow every single thing. And that just, you know, once I got that out of my system, things got a lot smoother. I think you may be dealing with something like that, like the transitional phase in your garden, are you not? Yeah, I just um, got over that hump last week. Like, <laughs> quite, quite literally. <laughs> I mean, you said it on air, so. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, but I've... Um, I've been teasing at this like for most of this growing season and it's interestingly enough um I don't feel like I'm stubborn I don't I don't need your feedback on this I I'd like to to live in the moment of I don't feel like I'm stubborn and interestingly enough this year some things not performing in the way that I wanted them to led me to realize oh, I'm kind of okay with not having it, you know? And so then that led me, I was already on the idea of diverse garden, you know, which means a lot of things in my mind, you know, or at least it meant that. And then it was, you know, the years, multiple years it took where you need to grow a number of plants to get the amount that you want. Peppers is a great example of that. You know, when I wanted my favorite, you know, tomato pepper sauce, I need a bunch of red tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't count if I say I don't want to hear from you and then you write a note and put it up to the camera that says you are stubborn. <laughs> I, I didn't say it out loud, though. You just did that to yourself. <laughs> uh, so so I, I realized like, OK, if I'm going to grow these peppers for the purpose of this particular recipe i need like 
10, 11 plants. That's a lot of plants, mm-hmm. right? You know, so anywho, I go down this road of the green beans over the years. We've talked about that. Like how many green beans do you need to grow for it to be, you know, worth your canning exercise and so on and so forth. And so that after I chased that for a few seasons and got the idea, now I'm able to, as of this last month or so, look back and say, planning for next year, right? And with the focus of hoping for a much smoother experience in my garden, there's some things I'm just okay with not growing. Yeah. Some things that I even like. Because if I can let go of the, I'm not growing all of the things. It's not everything that I'm eating for the year from a produce perspective. Like hard stuff. That's not what's happening in my garden. So now I feel much more comfortable with picking and choosing things that I just know are better from my garden. There's there's a whole formula that I'm developing um, that will be patented. Uh, so stay tuned. Well, I think it's, a, well, first of all, I think it's very important to develop our own formulas for our gardens and, um, you know, borrow pieces and parts from it. But, um, yeah, you know, let me ask you this though. Um, how are you in your tomato growing varieties, variety of varieties? How are you doing with that? Because I know that when we first met, it was absolutely out of control. So, and I know that tomatoes are one of those things that can be out of control for many, many people. Yeah, I rolled my eyes because I'm looking Deeply. at the, yeah, <laughs> like very intentionally so you could see it. Um, and my immediate thought was it's only being tamed because I only have the land I have to grow on. Right. So I looked across at this lot that, you know, the owner of the lot uses and I'm friendly with them. You know, I'm in this moment. I just realized, you know, maybe I should chat about using some of his space. So anywho, I say all that to say uh, if I had more space, I would still be. And I'm talking about like if I had a whole nother lot, you know, it would be a third of it would be tomatoes. And so I'd be right back where we were when I met you. Right. I've been forced into taming my love for growing tomatoes. So you haven't um, changed anything. It's just you're limited. I've decided to limit the amount of tomatoes that I'm growing because of the other things that I want to grow. Yeah. And I don't believe the like I had to grow 15 somewhere between 15 and 20 tomato plants if I had the space and then I was able to grow the other things that I'm looking to and I'm looking at the next couple of years I'm looking to grow over the next several seasons garden years Um, but I'll cut that in half it'll be more like seven or eight tomato plants right you know which is still less than where we started you and I started together yeah yeah yeah. I mean you were it was pretty deep when we first met yeah so Well, there are a couple of reasons, too. Um, So, you know, when you talk about like what the formula is, this is specific to tomatoes. Every variety isn't the same. Right. You know, as far as the production, as far as the taste, I grew a, a black strawberry this year and it was a unique taste. But that size tomato, I don't know the official name of it. So it's larger than a cherry tomato. It's like almost like a salad size tomato. So it's maybe the size of um uh, a half dollar right and so with that in mind um like you got to be on top of harvesting them they don't have the shelf life as long as you know some of your other tomatoes i find that they aren't as sweet as most times what you want from those when you harvest them at the blushing stage like some of the other tomatoes again this is my experience my opinion um and so they are sometimes almost too prolific as well. Because what are you going to do with all those little bitty ass tomatoes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, and so I look at that and say, oh, I I love to have a space in my garden every year to figure out, oh, this isn't the, necessarily the one, right? So what am I going to do with it is going to be the number one reason why I grow a tomato. Like, how am I going to utilize it? Um, and then how much does it produce because most times when a tomato is prolific it takes up the same space as a tomato plant that isn't yeah that's some i mean 
that's the daggone truth. I mean, it really and truly is. And it's, it's hard too, because, and I, I, I get it. You know, you love growing tomatoes, you know, well, first of all, let me say this. I had a dream the other night. I dreamed about you, Batavia. Mm-hmm. Um, I dream. I get that a lot, believe it or I not. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. It's hard for her to come in to record today because her head couldn't fit through the door. Mm-hmm. But she's got it. We got her in. I have my hair pinned up on top, though. That's the reason why oh, I can okay. barely get the head <laughs> set. <to it. laughs> but um, I dreamed that we um, that you had moved to North Carolina and that we bought. Uh, plots of land next to each other not at our houses but at our you know we had individual farms and i dreamed that we were testing different things and you had a tomato farm Mm -hmm. and you know and i don't remember anything after that but i remember that it was like this whole thing that we had going on it's pretty cool um and that that's the thing too is when we start getting into this it's especially at first you know because we haven't even really and truly touched on spacing much which is coming up in the future but before you learn about spacing you start cramming these plants in Mm -hmm. and we start Mm -hmm. getting them all on top of each other and we're growing green beans and spinach and lettuce and cabbage and eggplants and squash and at the same time not in the correct season but all at the same time you know all Mm -hmm. in summertime because we don't know what we're doing Mm -hmm. and as we go through and we start, you can start plucking it out. You know, I haven't grown an eggplant in two years. Mm. It just hasn't, I don't know, man. I just haven't been driven. You know what I mean? Um, I, I grow my butternut squash every other year. Um, you know, stuff like that. And when I started pulling stuff out, I got to a point where I, I was adding garden beds, adding garden beds. I've got my 11 that I have now. And I got to a point, I remember one year I was planning it out and I was like, I don't know what to plant in some of these areas. Like Mm -hmm. I had some spaces that were almost needed to be emptied. And then I started changing the way I planted. And then that changed the game where I was like, well, now I don't have enough to plant. So you're raising your hand. Why is that? Is that my hair? Is that a, oh, that's a plant behind me. Um, Come on, somebody. <laughs> I mean, I remember I remember looking at the planter app mm-hmm. and, and filling it in and thinking, OK, what else am I going to plant? And I was like, I don't know what else I'm going to plant. And I started and then I started digging in thinking like, well, what else could I plant? And, you know, I've grown stuff like chard and all that. But I mean, truth be told, when it comes down to it, I have never walked in my house and been like, you know what? I think I want some chard tonight. <laughs> I've just never thought that, you know, same with beets. I've never come in and been like, you know what? I think it's time to have some beets. Today is the day I've never had that. And so why would I plant that in my garden? Cause I can, I mean, that's a good reason, I guess, but in the production side of things and being productive, it doesn't really work out well. So, um, you know, as I've narrowed down what I grow now, I'm very happy with the amounts that I'm getting out of my garden. And I'd like to think that I can kind of get my garden to produce like it's coming out of a bigger garden. You know what I mean? Because I'm getting the stuff that I'm eating into the house, which eliminates stuff that we've had people. We did a whole show about not harvesting stuff out of your garden. Well, maybe we're not harvesting it because we really don't want to eat it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like deep mm-hmm. down inside, you're like, I, you know, I don't, I don't really feel like eating kale. You know, when I grew that curly kale. I didn't care nothing about it. I didn't want to look at it, didn't want to see it, didn't want to harvest it, didn't want to eat it, nothing. But then when I started growing, what is it, the Lacinato kales is what it's called? Yeah. Totally kale. different. Yeah. I was able to get in there and I I enjoyed them more. You know what I mean? And I'm going to be truthful with you. There's a lot of vegetables that I eat that I, I force myself to eat them because I know I need to eat my vegetables. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't have, I don't necessarily desire to eat a lot of them, but. You know, that's just how it is. So um, definitely want to focus on what we want to grow or consume. I think that I think that um, that when you think about, you know, I like the exercise of I'm, I've never woke up and said, you know what? I have a hankering for beets. And I think that what I've experienced over the last several years is trying to determine what grows well in my area what I as a gardener grow well, like what can I really 
have a good experience raising in my garden. And that influences what I grow. But what it doesn't need to do is lead to me growing a whole bed of a thing. Right. Um, I think that every several seasons that may shift. So one of the revelations was this year's cabbage sucked. I actually have a pretty long list of womp womps when it comes to particular vegetables that I planted. And I have some reasons why, but I was okay with not having dozens of cabbage. You know why? We'll talk about that on another episode. (laughs) (laughs) No, in all seriousness, it's the, you know, not having it in my garden led me to realize I do like cabbage. I enjoy them. You know, I think that they fit, they, you know, check off the list of the, they can be refrigerated for a long period of time. Um, With the exception, the only downside for me is the cabbage butterfly, which means that it added to the list of things that I choose to cover as a method to manage against the pest. And that's, you know, the less I could have of that, the better. But again, that's on the list. Um, But I also realize that it's generally a longer growing crop from seed to maturity. Um, And I look at it and say, like, how many do I need to be satisfied? Like, I'd love to have a few in the spring and a few in the fall and and call it a wrap, you know? Um, And so when I think about that's where I am. I think I've had probably as much as like six or eight across a season and generally have been happy with that. But I'm also OK with not having I mean, I had like two regular kind of green slash white heads of cabbage this year. And I was just like, oh, all right. You know, so I think you go through for me, if I didn't grow cabbage, I would probably my uncle cooks a mean pot of cabbage, like steamed cabbage. And I'd probably have them when he brings me a plate around the holidays. And that'd be it. Yeah. If I go to a, a Jamaican spot for some takeout, you know, that's a common side, right? That's when I'd have it. I wouldn't purchase it from the store to cook it. And so I look at a, a number of vegetables in that way, because we talked about this years ago, where like our routines for most of our diets are pretty much the same foods over and over and over again. Yeah. So growing cabbage allows me to insert that level of diversity in my diet, not just my garden. Yeah. But I don't need 20 of them. No, but, you know, I do. And yeah. so everybody's individual different. And I mean, the thing is, is growing things in your garden, we, we've got to move on, but growing certain foods in your garden I like it here. Can, sub, can introduce you to ways to eat other things if you're willing to accept that into your mm-hmm. life. Um, okay. So the next one is, and this one seems really basic, but I struggle super hard and it's water needs to be very close to your garden. You need to be, have readily accessible water. Um, I put my garden in the back of my house in the back of my property with no water anywhere near it, thinking I was going to run a hose. Very difficult. I struggled for a long time. Um, And I shoot myself that I did not put the irrigation in earlier. I just didn't know about the system until early enough until, you know, recently. But once I did that, it changed the game. But I still struggle with it because I lose so much water pressure pushing water back there. And I could Mm -hmm. put a faucet in, but, you know, it's going to cost me fifteen hundred bucks to do that um, and to run water back there. So I kind of step back from that. But um I did this with mushrooms. Remember when I tried to grow mushrooms? Mm-hmm. My The only reason why I was not successful and could not keep up is because I did not have water readily available. And so I never watered the mushrooms. Um, that was the problem I had. So everything else I did right, I set it up good. And then it got dry and I could not keep up with it. Um, watering is really important. But I just, I don't want people to fight themselves having to water, you know? Yeah, for me, I'm still hand watering everything. And this year probably was the more challenging because life was more challenging. And so the uh, timing, you know, the consistency of watering, um, I don't think that it necessarily negatively impacted my harvest. We'll find that my biggest concern is going to be the sweet potatoes. While they don't need to be, you know, constantly wet, I like 
they have been on their own. And then we got like five inches of rain across a week. And yeah. I'm worried about, you know, them splitting because they were at, at the le- later part of their growth and they had been without water consistently for a, quite a while. But we'll see. And we'll probably see around this episode airing. Ooh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Almost I'll be time. pulling them up then. Yeah, it'll be time by then. I'll be headed towards my first frost, average first frost. Um, so a lot of y'all know that I have... Um, water by hand it's a like 125 feet by 25 feet excuse me 1000 125 feet by 25 feet plot is what my home is on and that includes the house the garage and all of that so i don't have like a long stretch you know from the front yard to the backyard but i was watching i'm pretty sure i got this hose this year or last year and dragging it back and forth on the concrete I can see where it's peeling away. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, are you telling me I'm replacing hoses every year now? And so one of the notes here is like, you know, invest in a quality hose. And now I'm like, oh, let me go back. I think that was like kind of the mid grade <laughs> hose yeah. that I bought, you know, and I may be paying for it quite literally. Yeah. It's still enough time in the season. If I bought it this season, I'd take it back. Well, I will say this. If you're going to put money into a garden, I think um, your irrigation should be the place. And I will say this, if you're moving hoses around and stuff like that, industrial grade hoses is what you want to get. Mm-hmm. You know, something um, they usually are like red rubber and um, they they last a long time. They're easy to coil up. They don't kink really nothing. Like they, I mean, you got to spin for it. You know, I ran mine underground, which was kind of a pain in the butt. But um, I did that for a number of reasons. One, I just got tired of tripping over hoses Mm -hmm. and moving them when I was cutting grass and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's easy when we're putting in a garden, but, and we, we went in, so we have an honorable mention at the end. Um, but this one, we understand that the people listening to this episode have already got your gardens in place. And the chances of you moving it closer to a faucet is, is not really a thing. You know what I mean? It's a it's a difficult process. And mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of us have put a lot of time and effort cultivating our soil, building it up and all that. And doing that, doing so, you don't just scrap that and say, well, I need to be closer to this. But getting your stuff, getting it straight and using this time of the year. Look, you're still going to get warm days so you can futz with the water a little bit and you can move it around and figure it out. Uh, I mean, I was trying to do mine with overhead sprinklers before, and I would legit, especially this time of year, I'd like I would sit back and say, okay, what struggled? And it was always the water, always, every single time. Like, this part's not getting water. This isn't getting water. I'm watering too much here. This, I mean, there's a whole industry for farms to find hot spots, you mm-hmm. know, high spots mm-hmm. where they don't get a lot of water. Um, and I would go out there in my bathing suit. And just like get sprayed in the face by the sprinkler over and over until I like tweaked it the way I wanted it. And then spring would come and then it would be like, well, that wasn't enough, you know, and I could never, ever, ever get it enough. That was just like, I don't know what it was. It was just frustrating. So um, it's one of those things. And, you know, I will say drip irrigation is the way to go, um, but. I couldn't imagine hand watering. That would drive me insane. I just don't have enough time for that. Yeah, I think, and our climates are different too. Yeah. So the requirement, how often you hand water, you'd be hand watering much more often than I do. It was, it did test my patience this year. Um, So a lot of us, and it's a nice uh, note that a lot of us already have our gardens in place. And so like the relocation of things is probably not on the top list to do, but it's still a nice nudge to perhaps if you have been thinking about drip irrigation, you know, some of us aren't in our forever gardens, right? You know, once you compensate for a thing, sometimes you forget that the thing is really an issue. Yeah. Right. You know, so you've been working at this and working at this and you now you have a system in place when it comes to watering, but it's really not. I mean, there's a lot of friction there. Yeah. But you've just overcome it. But that doesn't mean that that's ideal. And it doesn't mean that you can't have an ideal plan or a place or a system in the future. Right. You know, so take this as your friendly reminder. Think about your watering strategy. Well, the thing, too, is if you're somewhere that you're going to be for a while, 
and let's say you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s, and you're like, I'm going to move buckets of water back here. That's not going to last forever. You're, you know, and it, it's great exercise, you know, whatever, but eventually it's going to get harder for you. And so thinking about that in the future and starting to kind of tweak it a little bit more, a little bit more, because again, I looked at it this way. If I was, you know, all the time I spent messing with my irrigation, I could have been doing something else more productive in my garden. I could be weeding. I could be turning compost. I could be starting seeds. I could be harvesting stuff like that. And so by automating it a little bit more, making it easier, it has definitely helped me progress in my garden in a positive way. So, you know, just make sure that you're pretty close you know, to a water source, you're comfortable with what you're using. And I will say this, don't go to your local Dollar Tree and buy a hose. You know, um, (laughs) if you need something in a pinch, fine. But I'll I'll tell you this, those cheap hoses, when you have to repair them, Mm -hmm. it is a pain in the butt to repair them. You get a nice expensive hose and you accidentally cut it, you can go ahead and you can slide a fitting in there and it's a lot easier. It's just the materials are better. Uh, and it, it's a hard pill to swallow. You know what I mean? Also, don't go cheap on your hose nozzles. Like yeah. if you're, you know, spraying. Um, I pulled into the on the front of the house and I had, I don't know where I was going. Oh, I was picking up my mom. And I knew we were going to go to the store. So I was trying to clear out my truck. And so I had a case of water, 40, 40 bottles. Did the math. That's five gallons. I carried it. Now I was under the weather, so I just wasn't really feeling the best. But I carried it from the trunk to the front door and literally stopped at the front door and said, I don't know how many more I have in yeah. <laughs> this in me. Like, and I wasn't talking about I had one more, uh, you know, package to, to pull in. But I just meant like, I don't know how much more in my future am I going to be able to bring in these big old, yeah. you know, jugs of water. And obviously five gallons is something that I work with containers all the time, five gallon buckets. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a five gallon bucket crew here. You know, we're not, everybody knows that. Um, so the next two we're going to combine together. Um, and so good soil and then along with good soil is amending your soil. Um, I argue that gardening is not necessarily growing plants. It's maintaining soil. And the plants and the harvest is the outcome of that. What do you think? Um, I'd agree. I'd agree. And it took took me some time to kind of focus on that. The um, soil dump that I got in 2019, which was for like, I am digging up the front yard and I'm going to have a front yard garden. That soil is very unique in my garden. Like those two... 10 by three and a half feet beds. I don't, I always forget which way you're supposed to do it with by the length. Doesn't but anyway, matter. Yeah. You, I think you guys know that I don't have a 10 foot wide bed, but um, so those two beds, the soil is basically identical. Very, very easy to dry. Um, I've produced quite a bit of food in them, but not very pliable. Also not sandy at the same time. Like if I don't keep it covered, even if I do with mulch over the season, and I'll show you a picture or a short video, my friend, of it. Like I am, I need a pickaxe to break that soil up right now, yeah. you know? And I look at it and say that I've not really focused my energy on improving the soil, right? I have done the standard all right, I'm going to add a couple of bags of compost. I'm going to cover it in the last couple of seasons with some leaves and it'll be fine. Right. You Has know, it gotten sure. better? Hmm? Has it gotten better? No, but I've not been consistent in the, okay. I think this is the sixth season. Yeah, this is the sixth year that I've grown in it. Because I didn't realize in the first couple of seasons, like when I put the soil in, because think about it, the soil drop was three doors down. I had a wheelbarrow, my version of one. By the time I got to the top of the beds, I was at the bottom of the soil drop. Yeah. So the soil got worse as I dug down and that ended up being what I'm primarily growing in, you know? And so, um, the very last of the soil is in the backyard in a four by four foot bed. And I've worked to improve that soil just 
you know, maybe smaller space, easier to manage. It's much better quality over the you know years now than in the front yard garden. Um, so I say all that to say it's still growing food, right? You know, but it's at a place where I need to focus my attention on it just to, I mean, to be a steward of the garden. Yeah. And I mean, good soil is... <sighs> There's a lot to good soil. It's nutrients, it's drainage, it's, you know, the, the structure of the soil. Um, and when you have bad soil, if you start off with bad soil, it's incredibly difficult to get it better. Um, the best way to do it is start off with a decent soil and stay on top of it. Uh, and this is where, you know, this is why I combine because amending is a big part of it. Compost, you, you can grow in compost, but you're not going to get the same benefit as if you had soil and compost mixed together. Mm. Um, you know, Batavia is always talking about getting leaves from people and stuff like that. Like that's a great way to do it. A uh, manure, anything that adds, decomposing matter back into the garden but the problem is we as gardeners know that compost is black gold it is Mm -hmm. the most important thing right that's what we think so what do we do we add more and more and more but as that compost starts to break down when you look at your garden you'll start to see a crumbly texture Mm -hmm. well that's because there's no soil anymore it's Mm -hmm. just decomposing matter so we want to be adding soil. We want to be adding compost. We want to be, you know, you know, there's a whole no till world out there and I'm not totally in that ballpark. I, I like a little bit of till because you can pull that soil back up and remix it a little bit. You know, you don't have to do hardcore tilling, but it's good to get a little bit of mixing going on because you can pull the soil from the bottom to the top, set it on top of that decomposing matter. It will then again, because when it, whatever's on the surface is going to dry out, right? Mm -hmm. Unless we mulch it, which mulching is part of this. But once we do that, that stuff at the bottom, that decomposing matter that was at the top is going to stay wet and it's going to start to break down faster. And so instead of just, you know, if you've ever had a compost pile and you're like, hey, I'm just going to cold compost, I'm not going to turn it. It'll take years to turn it into compost. But if you turn it, it can be a month, two months if you do it enough to where you can actually get compost made. So it's the same idea, you know, and, it, and it's not like you got to go out there and be like, all right, I got to till around my plants. It's like, hey, you pull everything out of the garden, go ahead and mix up the, the soil. Go ahead and put in the, your leaf mold, your manure, your compost, your nutrients, you know, your matter, stuff like that, and let it break down. Let it take time. I just added a trailer full of horse manure out in my side yard and it's just going to sit for the whole winter. The only thing I'm going to do next is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to cover it with straw so that it will stay moist and it will break down faster. That's the only Mm -hmm. thing I'm going to do, but we've got months to get that all situated. And so like when we come into this time period, that's like, Hey, it's cooling off. My plants are going, I'm not producing as much. I'm going to take time off. This is really like the last push and what will set you forward into your garden next year, because all of that manure will break down over the winter. And then when we goes to planting it again, we have supercharged soil ready to go. Supercharged soil. You like that, don't you? It's like uh, from Marvel or something. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, good soil is really important. Fertilizing is part of it. Um, I'm a big proponent of organic fertilizers because they feed the soil. Um, I got a gentleman commented on um, my YouTube channel the other day, Sandy Bottom Homestead. And I liked what he said. He was like, I use um, organic and synthetic. He's like, I use the organic fertilizer to feed the soil and I use a synthetic to feed the plants. And I was, you know, I really like that, um, that approach. And I've said this a lot. I don't like the idea of like, this is how I garden. This is the only way I do it. Mm -hmm. It's like amending your garden plan for yourself and using everything we have available to us. And so I think that was a really good way because, you know, we know that those organic 
fertilizers will feed the soil, will break down, feed that microbiology, which will in turn feed the plant. But if you need a quick boost, shoot it a little bit of the synthetic and get it going. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I think also let's not um, leave out the idea of keeping track of what you've been growing in those spaces, Mm -hmm. right? Because different plants are taking different nutrients from the soil, you know, so year by year by year, what have you been growing? And I mean, I'm not one to keep, you know, super detailed notes. Um, I'm more of the, you know, when I'm moving crops around, it's more of kind of do no harm. Right. You know, trying to outrun disease um, more than anything, you know, uh, but there is also for this one bed in particular, um, what have I grown in the, the bed and what have been my mulch and watering practices like those things combined, I think, matter for a particular space. This is a space that's exposed, you know, the most probably in the garden to sun throughout the year as well. Yeah. So there's that to consider. Um, I They're in the meadow beds and there is another um, garden bed that's smaller, same metal bed. So it's not that because that soil makeup is different compared to the other two. And the soil makeup that went into it was different and the soil makeup today is different. And so I go back to the original soil dump. Um, but. You know, it's it's something that I have on my list, right? You know, um, and I'll continue to you know tweak. Yeah. Now, if you have like you have bad soil, um, first of all, the power of mulch is unbelievable. Uh, Batavia just said she's got a section of her garden that gets all the sun. Um, that mulch will help with that you know not drying out the soil and stuff like that so pick your best mulch that you want to use and go for it Mm -hmm. um and that's that actual bed doesn't have any mulch left either and that's that's shame on me right you know and so in my mind it's the oh i'm gonna work that bed up a little bit more and i'm gonna go ahead and get you know as i put it to bed for the year like that's my plan but it's sitting exposed it's been weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks that it's been sitting and exposed and that doesn't do it any favors you no, know and winter time is a great time for that because i mean you you let it work itself yeah it, especially for a place like for me that i'll get snow so that additional moisture you know the idea is that's going to help this soil coming into the spring so again i'll be fine i mean i wouldn't even consider it bad soil necessarily but it's not the best soil in my garden it's not the um healthiest for lack of a better term garden beds in my garden well i got in the wild garden that's being moved i had gotten some soil that i consider bad soil Mm -hmm. um it was compacted and then Mm -hmm. i did some things i mulched i put some stuff in it i put some more topsoil in and i turned it and tilled it and you know at this point it's about and this is about over i'd say two years of working it it's about 50 percent right Mm-hmm. Um, that being, you know, with that being said, it, it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm pulling the plug on the, the garden beds itself. Um, and I don't feel bad about it, but the effort was put in there and it definitely, you know, we made a difference in it and it was a good, good experience, but I wanted, you know, I didn't want to pull the soil out. I, I can get things to grow in it. But I don't want to focus my energy planting vegetables in an area that's just not going to grow well. And I've mulched it and added and I did all those things to it. And it's getting into the right space, but it's just not quite there. So we're going to move on. And, you know, this is where like cover crops can also be added in, um, you know, to break up the soil, to feed the soil, to add green manure to, you know, green manure is just plant matter that breaks down. Um, adds nitrogen back in you know all these things you can do there's so many different things that we can add into our garden beds to amend the soil to in turn give us good soil so we can have you know because the problem with it is you can't see what's going on in the soil so you don't really know what's going on the only thing we can do 
with our eyes is say, is the structure of the soil okay? And are we giving it enough nutrients and stuff to continue to do what it needs to do? That's mm-hmm. the only thing we, other than that, you got to get a soil test and go from there. Mm-hmm. And typically speaking, a soil test is not going to give you a quick fix either. It's just going to tell you like, hey, add more of this, add this fertilizer in. Um, a lot of them are quick fixes. A lot of, you know, it's it comes down to mulching, compost, manure, stuff like that, and turning the soil over. Um, one of them, another one that's really important, really important. You're going to hear more about this in the future too, is we want to choose varieties that will mature in your growing season. So Batavia just said that she's about to harvest her sweet potatoes. She's pushing the envelope on them. She's going to get them. But the question becomes, are there other options that we can use? You know, there's, there's not another vegetable that I can think of that would mimic a sweet potato as far as flavor and as far as like, you know, stuff we want to do with it. Um, but when it comes down to like, you know, squashes and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different varieties that we can pick and choose from that will produce in the time frame you have in your garden. Which one are we on now where you're questioning my sweet potato growing? No, you have mentioned it many times. Mm-hmm. So um, there are a few crops, sweet potatoes, melons, winter yeah. squash um, that are on my, do I really have the heat, right? Um, are my hot days hot enough and do I have enough of them? Right. You know, so a hundred plus day crop like um, sweet potatoes that I am planting in June because that's where we're consistently getting above 50 degrees. I think that I could plant and I, I, I hate to be a glutton for punishment and beat myself up on this. I think I can plant my like squash, winter squash a bit earlier, but I feel pretty strong about like I'm getting the sweet potatoes out as early as possible. I've seen the damage to sweet potatoes like in May. Now there may be some Chicago ones. Hey, that are planting them earlier. And if you are DM me, like talk to me about like when and, and how successful you are. Cause I still have a theory of, even if I did plant them May 20th and they survived when are they starting to take off when is that growth really starting to happen you know and so I don't have the the numbers here um, of when I planted out my sweet potatoes but there is something to be said about um, I'm probably nearing the 100 days and I have to get to them before the bugs start to get to them which means a lot of times that they are more mature than they really need to be under the soil. Um, I was thinking about this this morning, like kind of random ideas about where to plot my sweet potatoes next year. And I'm really going to wait until this year's harvest to determine it. But when I said, oh, maybe I'll plant them in this set of beds, I immediately thought, that's like, that's it for the season. Like I am dedicating this set of beds to the sweet potatoes, like hard stop. So, I mean, you do you do have a point. Um, the honey nut squash is similar. I won't make a pie out of it, but it's like kind of similar to me when it comes to the sweetness. Right. So there's that, but it's still a long crop too. Well, so sweet potatoes, I just looked it up. Um, production by state is leading um, North Carolina, then California, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. So all of those have um, long, warm mm-hmm growing seasons Mm -hmm. um you know and it's important that we think about this too look you have 100 days of frost-free days Mm -hmm. plus how many frost-free days do you have do you know i think it's 100 and like just under 200 190 something right and but of those 109 let's say let's call it 200 of those 200 frost-free days how many of those days are actually conducive to sweet potato growth Right. Just like for me and broccoli, you know, we've got 200 and I don't know, 60, 70 days of frost free. And of those days, we have a very small amount that are conducive to it. Now, the benefit of of broccoli 
and you know that the cool season crops that we're planting now is that they can handle and they like the cooler weather so we can kind of cruise through a little bit but if you're talking in between you know the actual growing season last frost to first frost you're missing a big portion of it because i don't have a great season for it um i looked it up in illinois um the main crops for illinois which i mean these are all for farms are soybean corns and pumpkins apparently pumpkins grow really good in illinois don't know why but that could be something that's a longer season crop too, isn't it? I've never grown pumpkins. It may be a longer season crop, but it may be that the weather is better for it, right? Mm. So, um, I mean, there's is others. Pumpkin, are pumpkins considered a winter s- squash? Yeah, they're squash, right? Pump- Technically, well, I don't. I'm, I'm not. I don't know. Somebody's gonna probably email us and tell us, which is fine. But Leonard, yeah, Leonard ain't gonna help us there. Um. I don't know. I know I grow seminal pumpkins, which look like a pumpkin, but they resemble a squash more so than an actual pumpkin does. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. And they're harvested green. I think I saw greenish. What are seminal pumpkins? Seminal pumpkins. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't turn. I mean, they'll end up turning colors, but they don't really turn colors like that. So, I mean, you know, when you're planting your garden, though, and this kind of goes back in line with like what your family likes to eat. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that just because you can buy it in the grocery store doesn't mean you can grow it in your area or you should Mm -hmm. grow it. Um, Mm -hmm. And what that really comes down to is you can grow it, but you're not going to get the production that you could possibly get somewhere else. And your efforts may be better focused in other areas. Now, Batavia grows sweet potatoes. Look, I don't think she should be growing them in Illinois, but if she wants to grow them and she's happy with what she's getting out of the effort, then by all means, you do it. You know what I mean? And when I say I don't think you should be doing it, that's not, it comes out a lot worse than I mean. It's like, I don't think it's the optimum crop. I've told you, and I think you're starting to see like cabbages grow really well in your area. Like you were harvesting them in like July, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You see, he's trying to soften this thing here. No. Because not only did he say he put a big fat X on my sweet potato growing, then he basically said, I've told you what grows well. And let me give you the example of you saw that you had, you know, cabbage in and, you know, July. In all seriousness, my grandparents, God rest their soul, would agree with you. Oh, really? You know that girl's, yeah, you know that girl's growing sweet potatoes. Why would she be growing sweet potatoes? Well, how much space do you um, give to your sweet potatoes? How much what? How much space do you give to them? This year I did a four foot bed by 12 feet and I probably planted it up to like maybe eight by four or something. I know for sure I've never really given sweet potatoes and potatoes are two sets of crops that really want to do well, but I've never really given them the space I now I've already learned that they need. Like I, I try to cheat the system with both of those crops, kind of squeeze them in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the sweet potatoes, I know I am pushing the envelope. So it, this is this banter is real banter. Like I'm not offended at all. Like if I were advising somebody in Chicago, I'd give the cons of growing sweet potatoes. You know, melons is another one. I am still shout out to the purple thumb gardener who's in Philadelphia. And I feel like we have similar weather Mm -hmm. and I haven't, I'm going to have to pull it up on time and date past weather. She grows kick, but melons like watermelons, like huge watermelons. And I just haven't stopped to say, all right, girl tell me when you start them tell me when you're planting them you know and so on because i feel like if i just mimic what she does i probably have better success um, but i also believe my grandparents got rest there so i started growing these things after they had passed on would say girl wait hold on you know that girl is growing trying to grow melons what what kind of melons watermelons yeah watermelons now where would she get an idea like that <laughs> so if i can turn it on myself I would say I have no business growing Brussels sprouts, mm. none whatsoever. Um, yeah, I've, been, I've about given up on Brussels sprouts. Yeah, I have it and I won't. I mean, I got a mm. full bed planted of them, mm. but I just, you know, it's one of those things. Like, I understand the challenges. Like, I went into it 
and my state extension was like, you can have a good year, you can have a bad year. You know, it, it's not a definite in North Carolina. And I'm like, it's fine. I like them. I want them. I'm doing this. And it's one of those things like if I eliminated it from my garden, I'd probably have so much of an easier time. But it's like you, I really enjoy them. I'm not going to get the amount of Brussels sprouts that you're going to get because my climate's not conducive to it. But I'm willing to take that chance. And I think that we all need to have that experience, too. I mean, it took me five years to get a Brussels sprout to eat. You know what I mean? Was it five or four years? It was a few years. Um, And so it took me that long. And then I just said, I'm going to do it again. (laughs) <laughs> knowing that it could be either or like it's clearly states brussels sprouts do not always grow well in north carolina in scene like that's it so i knew that going into it i just pulled up a thing here and it's, i i googled um uh illinois garden crop best garden crops and i just got like a list and um i'm not gonna read the whole thing but 90% of it is all like greens and and um, asparagus does really good there, apparently. But tomatoes, bell peppers, eggplants, and squash all popped up on there, too. So There's something um, about um, the... And I live in those kinds of lists. Yeah. Right? I live in the recommendations. Like, my starting point is what is recommended in Illinois. Well, that's not exactly true. My starting point is the, oh, I, I love to grow sweet potatoes. And then looking up, you know, recommendations around it. And there are a lot of things that just won't plainly say, like, I live in, like, you know, uh, Farmer's Almanac, Illinois Extension Service. They rarely say, nope, don't even try it. They'll give you the struggles you may have with it. And so sweet potatoes, I just, I think are super cool, yeah, right? You know, are. and so, and it's a kind of almost, well, we'll see if do nothing really works because <laughs> you know, I did nothing with them this year. It's almost like a do nothing kind of crop. And I feel like it's a good use of space. So I think the exercise, and we spend a lot of time on sweet potatoes in my garden, but I think it's super important, super important. Going back years ago when I first joined the podcast, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was really, really focused on protecting gardeners from themselves and then I realized I had to get out of their their way and let them figure it out themselves but my starting point before I plant a crop I may have the idea of wanting to grow it how does it do in my area and then I make a decision around am I going to push the envelope recognizing that I may not get the kind of harvest that young Ben does in North Carolina for sweet potatoes and that's okay. Yeah. Right. But let me see what I can get from it. And you can apply that to a number of different crops. I've watched some Minnesota gardeners. I don't know them personally, but they talk about things like, or people, you know, in certain parts of Canada, they talk about things like challenges they have growing tomatoes and my heart aches for them, but it's absolutely based on how cold it stays in the spring going into summer. And then how quickly it gets cold again, coming from summer into, you know, um, into fall. And then the, how their temperature kind of lies during the summer season. So one of the reasons I think Illinois, you look at something like some of these greens and it's that sweet spot, no pun intended around. It's not super hot. It's hot enough to grow some summer crops like tomatoes and peppers, but not so hot where something like collards and kale is completely fry. Yeah. They don't thrive necessarily. They still like it cooler. Right. That's the plant, you know, but that's how it is here. I mean, you know, it just completely fries Mm -hmm. and it's one of those things too. Um, look, I've got, I gotta, when we get off here, we need to have a talk about something that I'm doing and see what you think. But, Mm -hmm. um, I will say you, you've got to plant at the right time. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to fit, we had an honorable mention, but I'm going to skip it. Um, Because we're going over. Um, But you got to plant at the right time. Um, There is never a time when you need to plant cabbage and tomatoes at the same time. Never. Okay? I mean, you need to separate those by months. 
So just remember that as you go for because you're just you're fighting an uphill battle. Your your garden's going to struggle, and when you step back, you're going to look at it. And you're going to be like, "What what's going on? Why do I have crop failure here? Why do I have you know big giant gaps here and there and wasted space and all that?" I mean, a garden is supposed to be a place of beauty and production. It's a it's a very weird dynamic, and so we can we can do both of those, but we just got to plan it all out and do it at the right time. And so when we do that, I mean, you know, we use the planter app for that. Um, that helps us plan everything out visually. Um, it helps us with our crop rotation, which by the way, I saw something, I got to send it to you, Batavia. Very interesting about crop rotation. They're doing a study on it and, um, they're starting to find a couple things out that, are very very interesting so i'm um, all ears brother yeah it, well it's a the, the article looked like it was going to be super like long and in depth and, and it technical. was like yeah. one paragraph but <laughs> it was actually my kind of article because i'm like cool okay i got the i got the results you know what i mean or mm -hmm. like the working results but using the plant trap for your crop rotation and your planning of each one because it gives you a little graph if you go into each variety and tell you the planting dates for your area and the growing seasons. And so you can use all of that to your advantage. So check out the planner app, use the link below, get yourself a discount. You can use it on the Apple Google store, or you get it from the Apple and Google play store and you can use it on your phone, PC or tablet. Um, but that's something that we use a lot and it, it's for this exact reason, because we, once we got our timings down, it, everything starts to get easier. Some of us are working on our timings more than others, but even still, like even little steps. I mean, have you noticed changes in your garden since you were ch changing your timing a little bit, Batavia? Yes, I have. You have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember last year, I remember I saw you on your one of your videos pull up a carrot, and I wanted to jump through the screen and choke you because it was the most beautiful carrot I have ever seen. It was just like a magical carrot. And um, that was that I mean y you don't get that when you plant it at the wrong date. You just don't. You know what I mean? Like you planted that carrot at the perfect time and grew it in the perfect way in the perfect combination. We did, you had it next to your cabbages, right? Do I remember correctly? Yeah, I did. And I have that carrot still. It's framed over my mantle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are they? What's the name of that? Um, like what they do with animals? Like they uh, taxidermy. taxidermy. Yeah. I did that with my carrot. Yeah, it was. A, joking, I mean, guys. but when you get that experience mm -hmm. and you pull that up, and you're like, "This is perfect." You know, that first year I grew sweet potatoes and I pulled out forty pounds. I said, "This is perfect." Like you did it right, buddy. And then I went and I looked at my Brussels sprouts and they look pitiful and they were full of disease and just horrible. And I was like, this is not perfect. So, you know, once you start noticing that in each individual group, then you know, like, hey, this is when I'm going to plant and you go good from there. You deserve as a gardener to have some easy things. So if you're going to fight with Brussels sprouts, young man, and if I'm going to say, all right, 99 days has to be good enough for my sweet potatoes, like pull them out. Right. I, I need to have something that is easier. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm glad you reminded me of those carrots because it's such a great example of after I got past the part of direct sowing, thinning, I literally was done. Like I just waited. You know, I kept them watered and everything. And mind you, these were carrots growing on my concrete patio, the raised bed. Basically, it's just framing the soil as young Ben has, you know, decided to determine that a big old container, mm -hmm. you know. And so what was it like? We determined it was less than 10 inches of soil by the time things were pulled. Yeah. Um, like that was easy. Go for some of those easy wins which, you know, who would have ever thought carrots were growing? Carrots were easy. It's all about the timing of it. That soil was damp. The weather, the air was cool when I sowed them. They must have went in like in April or something. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, you, you, 
have to continue to start to work at that. And I'm speaking to future Batavia, fight the urge to give in to being tired, fight the urge to give in to the, okay, maybe later, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, I was telling my son the other day, I said, you know, there's, there's times I asked him, I was like, you know, in the spring, will you, will you help me more in the garden? Because there's times when I'm out in the garden until nine o'clock at night planting Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, you know, it's exhausting, but that's how you meet your deadline, you know, because I mean, let's face it, you got a deadline and you may not have an opportunity the next day. It may, you may, you may only be able to plant on Saturdays, mm-hmm. you know, really focus. So, you know, those are the times where it's like, look, I got to, I got to push through, I got to do this. And then by, by handling it that way, you can kind of meet these deadlines and get these things in the ground on time. And it is a mad dash. And when I learned that not everything had to go in at once, it changed the game because instead of being out there till nine o'clock at night, I was out there till seven o'clock, you know, and I had to do it half as much because the garden was in full rotation doing its thing. You know, like this, this um, fall when I planted my garden, it was a very slow burn. It was, I planted one bed one week. I planted another bed another week. I planted another bed another week. You know, I did stuff like that. So it wasn't terrible. So, and I do want to say before we go to the listener question, um, you know, I, I, I can hear somebody um, been so mean to Batavia, this, that, and the other. Well, this is for the purpose of the show. And remember, we all grow our gardens the way we want. We may not agree with how other people are doing it, but it's your garden and you do what you want. And so I respect Batavia's tenacity to keep growing sweet potatoes. It's, um, it's something to be admired because it's just like with my Brussels sprouts, like you're just determined. Mm -hmm. And I think it's cool because you're going to figure out a way to, to keep it going. And I will say that a little bit of black plastic in the, in the spring can warm that soil right up enough for them. I, um, I've actually read comments around kind of our interactions and (laughs) I'm a big girl, bigger than years before, but I'm a big girl. Um, And there may have been one or two episodes that we may have even pulled where I said something that just really came off flat and mean (laughs) and the reverse happened. Yeah. And so if I am one in the middle of an episode, I just feel like it's just it's not it. Right. Because I'm protective of young Ben and the perception of him, specifically when it comes to me. Right. You know, it starts with the world, but specifically when it comes to me. So I appreciate, you know, the gesture. But um, I, I'm, I feel pretty good about the nah man that's not the way that yeah. and it's been years that i felt like i had to say hold hold on horsey you know and so and and again it has been the other way sometimes i think i'm super duper clever and i listen back and it's like yeah you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> and also just again this is Does that probably should have done this Does on that happen subs- much yeah, right. We probably should have done this on our subscription episode instead where we get a little bit more raw, a little yeah. bit more real. Uh, but as you all can hear, he directs the episodes. So I am following his lead in the conversation. And we covered at the top. I could go long, you know. And so sometimes he has to pull it back around. And sometimes I don't care. Right. You know. So- <laughs> but you know what I love about you, Batavia, is I'll try I'll try to, like, pull us into the next portion of it. And you'll be like, Hold on. I'm not done yet. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, dang, I've been sitting here for like 10 I minutes. I like the, the attitude and, and that, you know, replication of what I do there. Because it, it's not that. It's real smooth and caring. Hold on, dear son. Yeah, I'm okay. not done yet. <laughs> I'd like to take more care with this topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pinocchio. So, We're going back to the OG 90-minute episodes now. All right, yeah, let's get we to are. This. Let's get to this question. All right, so look. Oh, uh, we've got question, 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 question. Um... So this comes from our Facebook group, Backyard Gardens Community Garden. And we have, here we go. Kimberly wants to know when to harvest peppers and tomatoes, when the nights below 40, or can I wait until we are expecting an actual freeze? (gasps) Hey, Kimberly. Get him out your garden, girl. 
So old Batavia would say, wait until the very last minute. I've harvested peppers and tomatoes out of my garden as you know, flurry, snow flurries are coming down and we're expecting a frost. Like I've basically harvested them to my floodlight, you know, in my garage. Um, It's just a stressor, you know, and so unnecessarily, unnecessary stressor. Um, I did a round of harvesting, you know, early in October. um, And I'm thinking that I'll probably have a handful, literally a handful of peppers in just because I'm using it as a refrigerator. Peppers do better for me um, staying in the garden. Tomatoes start to change for me. Um, If it's under 40 degrees and they're still on the vine, they're not ripening. One, two, um, there's distress on the actual tomato plants. I pulled some tomatoes in October and there was some scarring on them. And it's it's just based on the weather conditions and the shift. Um, And so, yes, you can wait until just before your frost to harvest them to answer you directly. Would I recommend it? If you have a plan for what you're going to do with them, I'd say get them out sooner. I will say this. um, If you don't harvest them god's gonna harvest them for you because they're just gonna fall right off the plant Mm -hmm. um that's happened to me i'd go out there and it was just like constant drop 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 um yeah so i agree with batavia um question i have for you though is why are you worried about stressing the plant when it's gonna die soon anyways no stress on the actual tomatoes Uh, so like it's visible you could see the the tomatoes have you ever gone to like a farmer's market and you see like the last of the crops yeah you know and it's like oh yeah (laughs) yeah i'm only they change their their appearance is much different i Mm -hmm. mean it's like i get darker greens Mm -hmm. and i definitely get more like you said scarring um so yeah i would just say i would say pull them don't leave them on there and and to be fair, if you have the time, right? So the harvesting the vegetables is not the biggest time, you know, spend. It's really what you're doing with them. Like I have some peppers right now that I'm on day two. They were pulled off the vine and I, I always have the best laid plans. I need to get them in a refrigerator. I'm not going to get them cut up and frozen like I want to put them in the refrigerator, buy myself a little bit more time. So yeah. that it? Um, because you this short, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm uh, <laughs> on the tail end of that cold I had, so I'm getting a little foggy in my head. But before we wrap and before you take us out, I want to make a note that this episode, like, it pops up at like 3 a.m. So I want to put this into the universe and say happy birthday to my mom. It's her 70th birthday. I will speak to her in a few hours from when this is released, but I'm gonna put that into the universe. Does she listen? No, of course not. Does uh, she listen to me on the radio? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting it into the universe. <laughs> well, I was going to say happy birthday to, to mom, but um, happy birthday, mom. <laughs> you have to just send her that one clip. How's yeah, that? I will. Oh, that's a good idea. And maybe then she'll start to listen. So, mm. yeah, my mom doesn't listen either. And she gardens. Go figure. <laughs> She's like, well, just tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. No, listen, there's hours and hours and hours. There's like 400 <laughs> hours of me telling you what to do. Gosh. But everybody, um, that's how you make your garden easier to grow. So um, don't fight yourself. Um, Batavia's going to keep growing sweet potatoes. I'm going to cre- keep growing Brussels sprouts. That's just the way it is, people. Mm-hmm. And um, we love y'all. Keep up the good work. Stay strong. Don't forget, movie next week. Hold your breath. Hulu. Check it out. Decent movie. Um, But we'll talk about the concepts behind the Dust Bowl. Uh, It really did put it into perspective, though, for me. So um, maybe it'll help you guys with the same. I know everybody in the Midwest is probably like, oh, gosh, not the Dust Bowl. But it's super interesting. And um, yeah. So be strong. Buy the Planner app. Come get some seeds from us. Link is below. New seeds coming out soon. Favorite the shop so you can come back to it. All that good stuff. And remember... We're going to learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. 
Well, we hope you enjoyed the show and thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by checking out our seed shop below. We have all kinds of seeds available for you and we're going to be adding new seeds shortly. So check that out. Get yourself some seeds. It's free shipping, over $35 orders. So go ahead, get a full garden. What are you waiting for? Order your seeds and stock up. Or you can become a subscriber. You can either be an Apple subscriber or a patron, and that will help support the show. You'll get one free episode every month, an extra episode, that is. So we definitely would like love to see you over there and become part of our crew. Join the Backyard Gardens Community Garden in Facebook. That's free. Go ahead, join that, and join the community where all the listeners get together, and they just they can help each other out with their trials and tribulations and just show off their gardens. There's not a better way to do it. And if you're curious about what's going on in our gardens, you can check out our individual YouTube channels. So I'm at Sandy Bottom Homestead, and Batavia is at Be Better Garden. You can check that out and see how each of us are growing and what we talk about on those, because a lot of times we will coincide with the podcast and help add information in that maybe we didn't get out in the show or we feel that's pertinent at a certain time of year. So check that out and enjoy seeing our gardens and what we do in them. And we have an Amazon store, which has all the products that we use and recommend in our gardens and it helps support our show. And we also add to this list periodically. So be sure to check it out periodically to see if there's anything that you need for your garden. Everything that you do, including a like and a subscribe and even a review, will help us learn to grow and grow for change. See ya.